So let's get started. So today we have two uh, half an hour uh, talks uh, <coughs> and uh, by Carlos and Jeremy. So Carlos, please. Oh, thank you very much, Pedro. Can you hear me? OK. Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here giving this talk. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'll be talking about this paper that came out last Friday with uh, Till, Bekindesi, Vasco, and his student in Porto, and uh, Jeremy, who is in the audience as well. And it's more, my talk will be more in the direction of bootstrap meeting integrability, and Jeremy's talk will be more like integrability meets bootstrap. And as advertised by Pedro, like one of the main goals is like was actually the main uh, outcome of this uh, talk, I hope, is that there is a quantity that naturally appears, naturally occurs in this bootstrap that I'll talk about, that will be very interesting to look via the lenses of boot integrability. So that's the main advertise that I want you to do. In order to arrive in this quantity and what is the bootstrap, so that's what I want you to talk, it involves these Lagrangian correlators. So we'll consider n equals four planar n equals four super mills. Now we consider a five point correlation function that is made of four, of four 20 prime operators. So the usual trace of phi squared. And the fifth operator is the Lagrangian insertion, the interaction Lagrangian of the theory. OK? And the outcome, what we do basically is that we'll do some sort of bootstrap that I'll talk you later, I'll explain later. But this bootstrap will tell you what is the sort of structure constants that govern this five point function, this correlation function. And furthermore, how this correlation function, how this three point function, sorry, map to very important quantities such as some Wilson loop expectation values. Let me point out that this is uh, like similar ideas have been worked out in the past, namely, for example, four, five, and six point functions of just 20 prime correlators have been studying similar limits. Because when we take the new polygonal limit of each one of these correlators, they map to new polygonal Wilson loops. And by doing similar analysis, some bootstrap exercises have been computed here, and also they computed what is the relevant structure constants that appear in such regimes, and how this map to this Wilson loop values. So let me point out that what was done in the past is this limit of a square becoming null of a four-point function, the limit of a pentagon becoming null on a six-point function, and the limit of an hexagon of the hexagon, this is not, okay, it's an hexagon becoming null on the six-point function, right? And then how this uh, map with the Wilson loop, what's the complexity of this map with Wilson loop expecta expectation values? The complexity of this map is proportional to the amount of finite cross ratios that such limits have. So for example, four and five, four point functions have two cross ratios, five point functions have uh, five cross ratios, six point functions have nine cross ratios. When you take all these limits to becoming null, you have zero finite cross ratios left and zero finite cross ratios left for four and five point functions. So in this way, this map of four and five is a trivial map with Wilson loop expectation values. And the first non-trivial map is this, six point function map, which depends on three finite cross ratios in the end. What we propose to study is a different limit, is a, but nonetheless is a very simple limit, which is the, sim the limit of this five-point function where we make a square. So we take all the null, all these four-point functions, or these four, uh, sorry, all these four 20 prime operators, and we'll, became them, and we'll make them null square, null separated to one another. So this is the Lagrangian, and all of them are 20 primes, and this is the sort of configuration that we are looking. And why this is interesting is, again, we have five cross ratios in general for a five-point function. But when we take this limit, we take four distance to become null. So in the end, we have just one cross ratio left. So we can think of this as the simplest map possible between correlation functions of these three-point functions and Wilson loop. And furthermore, the fact that we consider this Lagrangian will be very important, because this Lagrangian we allow us to develop a new map that is one of the main results that I want to present that maps these three point functions to another very important quantity in n equals four spring mills. That's the cusp anomalous dimension. OK, so that's the three things I wanted to tell you today. So basically, how we get, what can we bootstrap about these stru structure constants? How do they map 
with Wilson loop expectation values and how do they map with cusp anomalous dimension. And in the end, of course, motivate why do we care to study this guy, which is the main object that I want to tell you about, via some integrability uh, lenses or using some integrability techniques. Okay, so any questions? Okay. Perfect. So this first part, it involves some bootstrap and is the most technical part of the, of the talk. So if you just, if you're heavy core, like hardcore integrability will be the worst part you to look at, but yeah, bear with me, it's gonna be uh, very, very short. I'll try to make it brief. So we have this four point, this five point correlation function. This is the Lagrangian and these are 20 prime operators. And what we'll do is the usual thing that we do in Bootstrap, we'll do OPE expansions. So we will OPE between these two 20 prime operators. So that will be a sum over all the operators that can flow here. So over all the dimensions and the spins that can be flow and see like I'm already making an effort to connect with integrability by using S to spin, as Kolya suggested. No. So I, I've done my part. <laughs> I've done my part. <laughs> my part is done. <laughs> no, that's where I draw the line. <laughs> but okay, then uh, here we have the three-point function. This three-point function is between these two protected operators. And this excited operator, this spinning operator that is flowing on, on this channel. We're going to do the same thing on the opposite side. So we're going to also have a sum over all the dimensions and spins that can be exchanged. And this three-point function, that is the same thing here, symmetric. And then here we'll have a three-point function between the two spinning operators and the Lagrangian. And when we have these three-point functions of two spinning operators and a scalar, we also have several conformal tensor structures that are invariant on the conformal symmetry, and you have to sum of all of them. Each one comes with its own structure constant. So there is this polarization L, that you need to sum over, and each of this polarization come with one structure constant, which is this structure constant of two spinning operators and the Lagrangian insertion. And of course, this comes multiplied by something that is completely fixed by conformal symmetry, although it's very complicated, which is the five-point conformal block. Summing. Uh, at the moment, we are, okay, uh, it's a schematic, but yeah, we are summing over delta, but shortly, we're going to do the light con limit here, and then there'll be no sum over delta. <coughs> there'll be a sum over, uh, yeah, the, the twist will be fixed more precisely. So that's precisely what we'll do. So we're gonna take, we start with this very general expression, and also we have a very explicit way of writing this, although complicated. And then we're gonna make this new square limit. So when we make this new square limit, several things happen. Of course, I'll, not, I'll try to give this as many details as the time permits. But I think the best way to do it is just to write what is the answer and then try to explain each term, how do they come about. So that's, uh, yeah, just uh, bear with me, it's very simple. Gamma plus two, two plus gamma. It's almost done. So this very complicated Bessel, or this very complicated block, which is like some very complicated combination of hypergeometric functions, becomes this Bessel Clifford, it becomes a Bessel function, basically. So that's one of the outcomes, which is very simple, and that's how we can treat of all this stuff analytically. But let me just explain what happens here. So first of all, I put these hats. These hats are nothing more to denote that I'll be looking at quantities that are normalized by three level. So everything that I'll say that has a hat is like one plus lambda and then expansions in loops, if I'm weak coupling. So the second thing is that there is no sum before we had the sum over deltas. So here there is no sum. It's because all the operators, when we make this line and this line become null separated, we project into this leading twist channel. So leading twist, which for us is twist two. So these are the famous SO2 operators we can write trace of uh, z squared d with some spin. So the twist of this, these guys is two plus some anomalous dimension. Of course, they are unprotected operators. And this anomalous dimension is precisely what is appearing here. This use all the way, u1, u2, u3, up to u5, are the five independent cross ratios that parameterize a five-point function. 
And the only thing that is matter, the only thing that matter is that in this limit, as I said, there is a finite cross ratio that we call x, which is some ratio of u4 over u5. And let me just write it uh, just for completion. I think we, we have time to do it. So it's just some combination of positions of distances that remains finite in, th in this limit, and is in fact is the only one, is this finite cross ratio, x. g4 squared, 3, 5 squared, of course. Let me just name all the points then. Perfect. Something potentially very stupid to your question. So uh, double traces uh, not flying in the channel? No, single trace operators of, yeah, twist you. Yeah. Why, why the double traces? Uh, Why do they not appear? In the English channel, what were you OP1 and 2? Because they start from twist 4. Yeah. So they have higher twist. So, yeah. Thanks. So let me just, ah, OK. So, yeah. So it's only the single, twist, uh, single trace operators that are flowing. And uh, as I said, there is no sum over dimensions. But there is still some sums over these spins. So let me just uh, tell you what this J, big J is. Sorry, I come back to J. Uh, but it's the sum over S. <laughs> so that's allowed. It's just a change of variables. And this small J is uh, some difference like this. Oh, uh, yes, of course. Yes, yes, yes. So in this limit, all the spins and all the polarizations are going to infinity. And all, in fact, this big J is going to infinity, but this small J's here are held finite. So there are finite quantities that uh, this limit has. And in, and in this, uh, OK, so that's why these three sums become these three integrals. And this block, which is very complicated, becomes this Bessel function that depends on this following combination. So it's not very particularly illuminating. And of course, this multiplies the structure constants. So it multiplies the structure constants They are written like this. And here I replaced this structure constant, one dependent on the spin and the other depend on the other, because in this limit, both spins are going to infinity, but they are like a finite distance apart. And this is very physical to understand, is that because in this limit, when you make a new square, what is the divergences of this correlator, how the divergences are appearing, are precisely the divergences of a four-point function. And a four-point function has just one spinning operator following it. It has, it has two spinning operators. So as a matter of fact, this Lagrangian correlator, this five-point correlator in this no square limit, should factorize into a four-point function that captures all the divergences of this operator times a finite function that is depends on this finite uh, uh, ratio f of x. And furthermore, this is not only the one condition that should happen, there is another condition that this square should be symmetric under cyclic transformations, or in other words, if you do this OP channel, we should have the same expression. So that tells you, of course, that this four-point function must be symmetric under exchanging U and V. That's just changing these two channels of the square. But more precisely, more importantly also, it tells you that this function f of x has this sort of inversion symmetry. x goes to 1 over x. So if you just put random three-point functions for the Lagrangian, you're never going to observe a factorization like this and a symmetry like this. So that's the bootstrap. The bootstrap is what are the expressions for these structure constants that depend on the Lagrangian such that this correlator has this factorization and this symmetry. And by demanding that this happens, we can fix the following. So the outcome of imposing one and two in this expression is the following. So this structure constant that depend on the Lagrangian Will depend only, sorry, will depend only on the ratio S2 minus L, S1 minus L, which is finite. I will call this R. And furthermore, is related to this function f of x by the following, sim by the following uh, simple map. f of x is the integral x c of r, x plus r squared dr. Or if you want, we can also invert this. And it's, uh, sorry, you can write like x dc dx equals to the discontinuity of f of x. 
So we have this, they are the same expressions. It's very simple to see how can you go from one to the other. It's just take derivative, you see that this is basically the Cauchy kernel that you can invert using a discontinuity. So we have these things. So this is basically the outcome of part one. It just tells you that this structure constant depends only on this quantity. Ah, oh, furthermore, just one thing. And this, this fact here also translates to this quantity. Sorry. It has this inversion symmetry as well. So this three-point function depends only on this quantity and is related to this function, to this finite part of this correlator via the following simple map. And why this is important, this is my, my second part of this uh, connection with Wilson loop, is that this function f of x is not a random function, but it actually has been considered a lot in perturbation theory. And it was computed up to three loops and also up to strong coupling. And this function f and up in the leading order at strong coupling. And this function f of x is precisely used to access information of this gamma cusp. So how, how does this come about? Is that this function, as we know, this four-point function, when you, take them, when you make these points no separated, we have some square Wilson loop. This is equal to some square Wilson loop. If we add an ad, another operator here, basically nothing changes. So if you add a G4 with some Lagrangian, and this Lagrangian is not no separated to anything else, this is also equal to some square Wilson loop with some Lagrangian insertion. So this is our GL. And since GL factorizes, it's very simple to see that this function f of x is nothing more than the ratio of this Wilson loop, expect of Wilson loop expectation values with or and without insertions. So if, if you want to think of this f of x in perturbation theory, perhaps, you can write like some uh, four-point amplitude. And you, every order in perturbation theory, you integrate all the loops except one. So that's what this is telling you about. So in some sort of partially integrated amplitude. And by why people care about this is because since the Lagrangian is related to the Wilson loop via a derivative with respect to the coupling, we can write this in a, or in a more suggestive way as that the log of the Wilson loop, of the square Wilson loop derivative with respect to the coupling is an integral, some prefactor here, times f of x. Dx. So that's why people computed and care about this f of x. Because if you com can compute f of x and you can understand how. Okay, so let me l let's start on the left hand side. We know that the uv divergence of this Wilson loop is governed by the gamma cusp, right? It's like exponential of gamma cusp times something, times the divergences. You take the log, it just becomes gamma cusp. So if you can understand, if you can compute the f of x and understanding where the log divergences appear here, you can directly find a map between this function and this Wilson loop. And by, by computing this function, so this, this guy is known up to three loops, so up to four loops, oh, sorry, three loops, and uh, at, uh, also at strong coupling. And in this way, people also reconstructed the cusp anomalous dimension, this gamma cusp that appears here, all the way also to three loops and strong coupling as well. So that's why people computed and care about this in the past. But now that we have a map between this structure constant, there is a very simple thing that we can do. And th this is like uh, the main result that I want to present. Is that this structure constant with the Lagrangian, besides being related to this partially integrated amplitude, is related to the amplitude, to the gamma cusp via a very simple map. We know that the derivative with respect to some dimension of the coupling is proportional to this structure constant with the Lagrangian. This is a very conformal perturbation theory. It's nothing uh, crazy to expect. And the proper map is that when we have spin, so the derivative with respect to the spin of some dimension of two spinning operators with respect to the lambda, the proper equal sign is that this is equal to the structure constant with Lagrangian when the spins are the same with some particular combination here. And this is true for any spin. So any finite spin that you want, if you can compute this structure constant, you get access to the two-point function. At an at-large spin, what happens is that this structure constant depends only on this ratio, sorry, on this ratio r, where that I wrote somewhere, so on this ratio. And when the spins are the same, this ratio is 1. So this structure constant, if we just plug the large spin expression, it becomes the structure constant evaluated at 1. 
If you sum this from 0 to infinity, it's just summing 1 over j from 0 to infinity, it gives you some log j times dc. And this guy, this anomalous dimension, also at large spin becomes gamma cusp times log j. So by this very simple analysis, in this large spin limit, we find this other map, is that this is structure constant that we computed at r equals 1. It's equal to the derivative of the cusp anomalous dimension. Well, what time did I start? Sorry. Um, OK. So I have seven minutes. Perfect. OK. So with this, so let me just uh, put some boxes and try to argue why this uh, some sort of bootstrap meeting integrability is that this structure constant, perhaps, is one of the structure constant that we have most information on. We know this structure constant for this function r all the way to three loops. We know it at strong coupling. We know that when r is equal to 1, evaluate this to some cusp anomalous dimension. So in a, in a way, this structure constant here, this object here, which is this three-point function of a spinning operator, another spinning operator, and the Lagrangian. I know it's very strange to look at this object from an integrability perspective, which you write of, in terms of hexagons and so on. But in a way, it should be a very simple object, because it's almost like it's the three-point function that is almost look like a two-point function. So like this, I believe that computing this guy, I don't know, via these hexagons, or perhaps even via some sort of bootstrap in the same way that Frank did the octagon, because we know that this is given by some uh, uh, perturbation theory. This is given by some uh, expansion in harmonic polylogs and stuff like that. And these harmonic polylogs have very similar expansions, very similar physical uh, properties as the octagon. I think this object sits in the middle. It's, just, it's not as complicated as the octagon that has two degrees of freedom, two variables, u and v. And it's not as trivial as the cusp anomalous dimension that has no degrees of freedom. It just has one degree of freedom and somehow interpolates with this cusp anomalous dimension. So I don't know how to compute these guys from integrability or via some other bootstrap meanings or via anything else, but it would be nice to think about this. And uh, yeah, I think uh, I would like to open for questions. And uh, if you think that this is interesting and so on, please uh, let me know. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, instead of Lagrangian, could you do an operator which is coupled to, say, beta deformation? Uh. The, this part here, this box, does not care that this operator is the Lagrangian or not. So this is true for any other external operator that you put. You can find similar expressions like this. But the, the fact that it's related to the cusp anomalous dimension then is particular to the, the Lagrangian. Ah, okay. So I, I, I don't know. Like I, I don't know. I would say yes, but uh, to do equal signs precisely in the blackboard, like uh, I couldn't do it. But I believe it could be done. It could be done. So <clears throat> this three-point function, yeah, when you have the Lagrangian and then spin one, spin two, isn't it the the derivative of the two-point function between spin one, spin two, differentiated with respect to the coupling? Yeah, but it's. It's like this, right? It's so what you said, right? Or no? Yeah, the I'm derivative of the two-point function is equal to some three-point function, right? Yes, but, but why, this, it, why it, do you have this sum? It's not clear to me. Because when you have a three-point, ah, so when you have scalars, it's very simple, right? Because a scalar has just one, that has one, has one three-point function. It doesn't depend on this polarization that I told you before. When you have a three-point function that has two spinning operators and the Lagrangian, it has this other quantum number. So in, in a way, it would be very strange that uh, a single information, which is the two-point function, could tell you all the information about all these different polarizations. So that's why if you got, just give me the two-point function, I can tell you something about the sum of these three-point functions. So that's why you only have this sum here. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, but it's maybe <clears throat> it's not totally clear that looking at non-diagonal two-point functions, uh, you know, of course, they are zero. By non-diagonal, I mean when the spin is different. They are zero. They, they are going to stay zero when you perturb. 
but by a non-trivial fact because you have to renormalize the operator yes. in a sense. And so this could, in principle, I don't know if you looked into it, this gives give additional constraint on the C where the S are different, or do you think yeah, this is like doesn't put any constraints? We could see these constraints, but when we were working at finite spin. So when we were working at finite spin, in principle, this is three-point functions can be anything they want. But if you start to play around similar games, you see that a bunch of them are zero. More zeros than you would naively expect. But this is not true at, uh, at uh, large values of spin, because then it's only for very small values of spin that you see these zeros. Uh, and it's, it's some sort of like uh, saying that there is no, mi like it's about renormalizing these operators indeed. But uh, it is something that we can only do, like really do it at uh, finite values of spin. And that is, uh, yeah, different from, from, from what it is. Yeah, let me, uh, like, since I have one minute, let me just uh, say something that I find very cool. Is that this three-point function, if you just want to bootstrap in the same way that Frank bootstrapped the octagon, right, of writing a basis of functions and trying to say what are the physical properties of this basis of functions, this, all the properties of the CR are super constraining. The fact that it has this inversion symmetry, the fact that that some particular value is equal to the gamma cusp, and there is even, even more properties that are related to the fact that these are equal to some partially integrated amplitudes that tell you a lot about the discontinuities of this function, which is like super, super non-trivial. So like even, for example, at one loop, you can completely fix this guy to be log of R squared. So there is nothing else you can do. And the, then you fix, this you fix the coefficient by basically matching with the gamma cusp. So it's, it's very, very constrained in this object. And we have similar expressions all the way to three loops in terms of these harmonic polylogs. Uh, but all the properties that we have so far are not enough, like it was in the case of the octagon, to fix this object. But I believe if we work, I don't know, hard enough, perhaps we can do it. Kay. Can you write it as some semi-infinite determinants? Or? We want to do that. We are precisely trying to do that, yeah. We know in one case, right, when this r equals 1, this is already a determinant. Right? <laughs> but it's just a matter of, like, how can we decorate this determinant in some way that we can generate this rich structure on the left? That's what we are trying to do. So, yeah, we are not thinking about this uh, hexagons. We are more thinking about this uh, determinants or perhaps some, like, yeah, who knows, some trace with them distribution or something like this. Those are the formation of gamma cusp when you add this, some alpha parameter, right? Yes. Can yes. you re not relate it to the SAR? Yeah, we, the problem is that, yeah, that alpha just uh, tells, shifts a bit the zeta functions, right? And, and, and the zeta value, sorry. And uh, we want something more. We want to introduce really like uh, some dependence on this x. So I don't, perhaps we could try to think about this, but as an expansion on around r equals 1 to get some information. Then it's just a number, and then we can understand perhaps like these tilted Bessel kernels, how can we... In a way, what I wanted to do is that there is this gamma cusp, which is like this alpha equals pi over 4. We want to promote this, this is now gamma alpha, and then we want to add another thing here, like x, that you could, uh, uh, when x equals 1, you match this, but then it's, uh, when x equals different than 1, you generate this full thing. Yeah. So there's one limit of this three-point function in which the hex hexagonalization simplifies because the matrix part drops, right? Because ah, essentially an abelian. Yeah, there is the two abelian ones. So yes. Which limit is that? This is uh, so the two abelian terms are when l equals zero, and when l is equal to the minimum of the two spins. So right, it was this one. If you L equals zero cannot be, right? Because we are very far away. And the other abelian limit is this. OK, I will say something that is basically, it's just to answer your question, but perhaps it's too technical. But uh, for you, you understand. Is that this, <laughs> this uh, if you remember correctly, the other abelian hexagon computed sums of Cs. So in a way, the other abelian hexagon that you are thinking will be almost this R equals 1. So, yeah. But there are two abelian hexagons. One is completely out of our regime. The other abelian hexagon should be what this, this R equals 1 is trying to reproduce. It's not precisely that because of this factor here, right? The abelian hexagon only computes this, 
And what we want to compute is something like this, so it's a bit shady, but uh, I think that the physics is, is, is like this. We can discuss also. Sorry about that. Ooh, yes, considerably louder. OK, uh, you can probably hear me. So I'm going to talk about the ADS semi-classics of the CFT spectrum at large spin. And I think this is a fitting topic for the workshop because it's an example where explicit results from integrability point to uh, more general properties in uh, CFT that are amenable to bootstrap techniques. So just like uh, Carlos's talk, uh, I'll be looking at uh, the large spin sector at fixed uh, twist. And this region is interesting uh, from a bootstrap perspective because there's a sort of universal perturbation theory. So in other words, the higher twists in this regime at large spin become approximately additive in the lower twist up to small corrections and anomalous dimensions, gamma, which um, in a generic strongly coupled theory would uh, admit power law decay in spin. Uh, but as you know, in, uh, uh, for single trace operators in planar gauge theory, admit logarithmic scaling. But in any case, this is uh, something you can hope to systematically uh, compute in a large spin expansion. Uh, the interpretation of this is that these twists correspond to uh, so-called multi-twist operators of length L that are characterized by this behavior that at large spin, they look essentially like uh, free field theory, like linear combinations of uh, normal ordered products of primaries O1, OL with uh, derivatives inserted and uh, primary condition on top. Now, <coughs> uh, for length two, this problem has been well studied in the bootstrap. And uh, for example, in a typical example where uh, you have a low twist, low spin operators here, like uh, phi and uh, sigma, and sigma is the leading twist field exchanged in the OPE of phi, then this gamma 2 of j, it admits this uh, power law decay going like minus tau sigma plus uh, systematic corrections in uh, 1 over j, which uh, can be computed with uh, various methods such as the uh, Lorentzian inversion formula. So this is quite uh, well understood. However, for uh, higher length, this is less well understood because of a large amount of mixing. So one way to see this is that in the free theory, the dimension of this space of uh, multi-twist operators, let's say that they're equal now, uh, it goes like the spin to the power L minus 2 over L factorial plus subleading corrections. So this anomalous dimension will be a matrix uh, that, uh, whose dimension grows with spin, and you have to diagonalize this to get the spectrum. Uh, 
Now, one way to see this uh, degeneracy is in an ADS picture, where these multi-twist operators, they form a Hilbert space that can be realized in ADS as uh, multi-particle states. So I'll represent them by uh, particles on the Poincaré disk, something like this. And in this picture, so this is a one-to-one -one correspondence between free field theory uh, operators and uh, multi-particle states of a free field in ADS. And adding in this anomalous dimension is like adding in uh, an interaction Hamiltonian. And so diagonalizing this anomalous dimension is like diagonalizing this interaction uh, Hamiltonian. So you can see this as a uh, L-body problem uh, in ADS. Moreover, in, in this picture, you should see these uh, particles as uh, in free theory as geodesics uh, rotating with uh, spin L. Uh, but the uh, total spin only constrains the largest distance between two particles. So if you, if you want, starting from twist three, there's a remaining freedom um, in the uh, multiple geodesic distances between the points. So this is where this freedom comes from, and this is what leads to a non-trivial uh, L-body problem. Uh, yes, sorry, sorry, let me write this larger. So this is some, some distance that goes like some spin variable log L, and this is uh, a geodesic distance, the largest one in the multibody problem that goes like uh, log J. Okay, so... The question is what, uh, how to deal with this uh, mixing problem, and uh, there are uh, hints given to us by integrability. So specifically, the planar limit, large number of colors, and single trace, single trace uh, O's. And in this case, uh, it's known that this gamma L of J, its large spin limit, is controlled by gamma cusp as a function of the tough coupling times the classical XXX spin chain in the SL2R sector. So here I'm specifically considering uh, leading twist operators, so I'm not putting in boxes. And uh, this can be understood, so at weak coupling, this corresponds to simply uh, solving the Baxter equation, uh, but with uh, an H bar that goes like one over J, simply equal to one over J. And this was studied by Korchemsky in the 90s, and he did a WKB approximation, bohr sommerfeld quantizations, and showed that uh, there's a good semi-classical approximation of the spectrum uh, at weak coupling. Perhaps more surprisingly, even uh, at strong coupling, uh, there's a nonlinear sigma model description of these states in ADS3 times S1. And it was found that the world sheets, in this case, localizes to these so-called spiky strings. So uh, the world sheets touches these spikes at the boundary of ADS3, and they can be identified with the sites of the SL2 spin chain, and their dynamics are governed by this classical spin chain at leading order. So this structure leads us to believe that the large spin limit, perhaps more generally, is governed by semi-classical quantum mechanics. So, and moreover, that these uh, higher particle interactions that we know to exist at higher loops are suppressed. So, using the, this ADS picture, our expectation is as follows, that the anomalous dimension matrix, large spin, is governed by gamma 2 of j times some classical Hamiltonian made by a sum of pair interactions. And the main result I'll try to explain is a very precise in L equals 3 case where we take uh, a model in 
ADS that models these uh, uh, large spin uh, CFT dynamics, and we find the following picture. So if I plot uh, the absolute value of gamma 3 as a function of spin, I'll find that uh, at large spin, the anomalous dimensions live in a band controlled by the uh, double twist anomalous dimensions. So here I have O equals phi, and the accumulation points of the double twist anomalous dimensions. So here you can see this as uh, the L direction. So I'll have some kind of band like this. Uh, and well, <laughs> sorry for my terrible drawing. And so the spectrum will be dots in this band. And what we find is that the semi-classics work well for most states. So for J over six states. Now the interpretation is that the remaining states where this doesn't work is in the case of this almost two body problem where two of the three bodies are very close to each other, so this is very high energy. Uh, and the semi-classical approximation breaks down. Whereas uh, near the uh, minimum for sufficiently low absolute anomalous dimensions, uh, the particles are sufficiently well separated to have a well-defined uh, semi-classical expansion. And in particular, the minimum corresponds to this equilateral triangle state. Um, so this is the picture which I'll try to uh, make precise. Um, is there anything else? Uh, okay. So the plan is as follows. Uh, first, I'll explain the ADS model. And then I'll explain the L equals 3 semi-classics. So let me start with uh, realizing the Hilbert space in free field theory to get you a picture of this uh, Poincaré disk. So the idea is to realize this uh, Hilbert space, which is essentially uh, the SL2 sector. I'll quantize uh, a specific kind of geodesic corresponding to uh, rotating motion in the phi direction with angular momentum uh, J and energy delta. So this is a specific class of geodesics. And then we go to the rotating frame where this angle of rotation is shifted by the time so that we're in the rest frame of this geodesic. So I can parameterize this by um, a uh, position alpha equals tant rho exp of i phi in the uh, hyperbolic disk. And if you quantize these geodesics, you find you can characterize the corresponding states by the following uh, wave function. So if I take its correlation function with uh, L uh, insertions of phi, I get the following form over 1 plus q squared to the delta phi minus 2, where all of this Hilbert space is encoded in these holomorphic functions of L variables on the disk. So in practice, uh, this uh, just corresponds to the same Hilbert space as the SL2 spin chain, uh, where we take, uh, but we realize it in this specific way as taking um, L copies of holomorphic L2 functions on the disk with a measure given by this power. And finally, we impose the SL2 highest weight constraint. So this corresponds to just this highest weight constraint. Uh, it's the same thing as uh, Simon mentioned. We can uh, implement it as saying that uh, Psi must be a, a homogeneous translation invariant polynomial of degree j. So this is the uh, Hilbert space. Now I'd like to explain how we 
uh, incorporate the interactions. So, ADS3. sorry, ADS3. Uh, but so uh, this is a this is at if you want I'm I'm picking out um, an angle in ADSD plus one. Uh, because my geodesics only rotates along this uh, phi angle, uh, but if I were to have uh, oscillations in the other directions, that would be like turning on transverse spin, which I put to zero here, but which I could also consider. Just, j j just to make a comment in this way, things it seems a bit like some ad hoc construction, but in principle, we can just take scalar field and ADS, ask what are the leading to its states, and they're just described by this subspace in Hilbert space. Yes. Um, indeed. So the way we model the interactions corresponding to this leading twist scalar, which I wrote uh, down there, is by a simple quartic interaction, where, which is mediated by the bulk-to-bulk -bulk propagator of the ADS dual of this sigma. So this gives us uh, an interaction Hamiltonian. And in first order perturbation theory, the matrix elements of the interaction Hamiltonian are just given by the matrix element of this potential. If I integrate out over the transverse directions of ADS, which uh, I encode in this uh, element Q, I obtain matrix elements of a potential on the disk, which reduces in this case to just a sum over pair potentials. Where these are holomorphic functions. And uh, due to SL2R symmetry, these can only depend on the geodesic distance between these points, whose singe squared I denote uh, by Sij. OK, so to see that this encodes uh, the large spin dynamics that I mentioned in the introduction, we can look at L equals 2. In this case, there is a single state, which corresponds to alpha 1 minus alpha 2 to the j, which we can normalize. And you can see that at large spin, you can look at the uh, configuration where this probability distribution is maximized it corresponds to where they're most separated. So uh, their, uh, their phases are, uh, differ by pi, and uh, their S12 is order j squared. And indeed, you can see that in this unique state, u2 of j squared plus corrections is equal to lambda squared times a number times j to the minus tau sigma which captures the leading anomalous dimension of gamma 2 that I showed here. For L larger than 2, there is no longer a unique state. But we can expand this uh, at large spin, and we obtain uh, a effective uh, potential, or uh, our Hamiltonian, if you will, which at leading order at large separation corresponds to some coefficients, let's call it uh, u0, times this leading power that you saw at twist 2. You could ask yourself, uh, what about uh, higher order corrections in perturbation theory? And you can check that uh, if you look at these overlaps for uh, higher order corrections, so they would look like perhaps a uh, diagrams like this with overlap against um, psi, that these will decay uh, with higher powers, like 3 over 2 tau sigma. OK. Sorry. Just put it here.
So to summarize, we have this effective description that captures the large spin dynamics, assuming that the particles are well separated, uh, with the Hamiltonian given by this uh, sum of peripotential interactions. You can see this, uh, the matrix elements of this Hamiltonian as the matrix elements of this function. And also, uh, this is equal to uh, the two-particle Casimir with respect to SL2, which can also be realized as a differential operator. So is it, is it obvious that it should be two-body two interaction only? Can you repeat? So is it obvious that it should be only two-particle interaction? Well, I guess you have to convince yourself that if you look at higher order corrections and you have these connected diagrams with uh, bulk to bulk propagators and take the large spin limits, that uh, these will decay. But if you want to, the power counting is that uh, every extra propagator acts, adds a power of j to the minus tau sigma over 2. Uh, but this is something you can look at uh, in to all, all orders in perturbation theory, and it's a uh, straightforward um, analysis of these integrals. I mean, how universal is this? Uh, it should be universal. It's a property of... Uh, like this consideration with written diagrams, how universal is that in a sense? Like there are some universal pits, but some unknown parts, right? For example, will it be true at weak coupling? Yes, yes, exactly. It will be true at weak coupling. Uh, This is just a geometric statement. The, the, the suppression is because distance is large, and when you have higher body interactions, you have to have you have more large distances because you try to, you to have three property, at a time. Yes, ah, but here, here, in, in, in well, I, I guess you, by weak coupling, you, you meant like n equals four weak coupling or something. Yeah. Uh, well, in, in planar theory, it's, it's not going to even behave like that uh, because you, you have log j stuff. No, no, but take product of trace of z squared. Yeah, but uh, I think it should still be true because you still have exponentially decaying propagators in EDS. I mean, in practice, you, you already know the Hamiltonian and uh, you can do this uh, analysis in this Hilbert space, which is the same as XXX. Yeah, but, the is still our but that's that's the point. Uh, the large spin limit uh, acts as a semi-classical limit. So, in other words, if you if you just uh, assume, make this identification, h bar equals one over j, do the WQ, WQB expansion, compare the semi-classical with the spectrum, it works. That's what I can say for uh, n equals four. Like that's the, the, the point here is that large spin, at large spin, the rail and distances are much larger than the ADS scale, and that's the thing that gives the exponential suppression, not the, not something else. Yeah. Anyway, at, at weak coupling, there is an order of limits which you can discuss, but uh, in, in principle, for a generic CFT, this seems to be a nice curtain. Yeah. I guess it. You know, th this picture you find in these, this work of Korchemsky, if you replace this by uh, minus gamma 3 over gamma cusp, and the minimum is minus 2 log j, and the maximum is minus 3 log j. So this is the uh, effective Hamiltonian. You can uh, just do exact diagonalization. It's a finite dimensional matrix. It's very similar to what Simon was explaining to us. Uh, but even easier for local operators. Um, and now I'd like to explain the, how this matches with the L equals 3 uh, semi-classics. So I, I take this uh, Hamiltonian in this uh, Hilbert space of XXX, and uh, I just do a WKB uh, ansatz, where I identify spin with my inverse h-bar. 
So uh, I think I'm limited on time, so I'll just explain uh, the result that uh, we get. We find that uh, the classical phase space, so uh, just to explain, we have this uh, primary constraint. This allows us to reduce the number of degrees of freedom from 3 to 1. And we have one degree of freedom for one Hamiltonian, so we're back in uh, integrability. So we have an integrable system. Um, and we find that the classical phase space is in CP1. And the symplectic form is that of the, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, hyperbolic disk yet again. So let me explain how this works, and let me explain what the Hamiltonian looks like. So our phase space is this ideal triangle where the cusps correspond to coincident points and the walls correspond to uh, pair potentials uh, diverging. At the center of this ideal triangle is the minimum corresponding to this equilateral triangle. And as I increase the energy, the equal energy contours will go closer and closer to the boundary. And at some point, this WKV approximation will break down. In other words, S1 will be comparable to S0 when the anomalous dimension scales like j to the minus tau sigma over 2. So this is where the semi-classical approximation uh, breaks down. Um, and what we did is we took these uh, equal energy contours of our classical Hamiltonian corresponding to the classical limit of this. Uh, we applied the Bohr-Sommerfeld quantization conditions, Bohr-Sommerfeld, just saying that in this case, uh, that this holomorphic wave function is single-valued, and its monodromy is identified with the uh, uh, excitation number. And using this, uh, expanding up to a uh, subleading order, uh, we found very good agreements uh, for the j over 6 uh, lowest energy states. So uh, with this, I'll, I'll end here. Uh, let me just say that... Uh, Again, we expect a, a similar behavior at uh, L uh, greater than 3, and we have some first results for the uh, lowest lying states. And um, I think there's a nice interplay here between uh, uh, integrability methods and uh, bootstrap. In particular, one can think about uh, you know, a, a improving uh, bootstrap methods when there's large degeneracy at large spin uh, using these ideas. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for your time. So, uh, well, it's quite general consideration. Can you apply it for fish net or fish, fish chain? I, yes, I don't see why not. Uh, it's, this seems to be quite a universal behavior that uh, at large spin, uh, the spectrum is, the lifting of degeneracy is controlled by uh, semi-classical quantum mechanics. Uh, so it would be interesting to, to study this in fish net, yeah. Yeah, there it should work uh, for single traces because the string bits are more free. Right? There's no log. I see. Where, where is the chaos in this three-body problem? Shouldn't there be a regime where uh, everything is very chaotic because three bodies are chaotic? Right, well, I mean, the point is that's what large spin uh, avoids. Uh, if, if you're at large spin, large separation, uh, you're ensuring that the interactions between the constituents are weak, and therefore it's a small perturbation of the free field theory orbits um, uh, in the absence of interactions. Of course, so when particles can go close to each other and interactions can become strong, then it, there can be chaos. Yeah. So this is like leading twist, so chaos would be like smaller spin, larger twist. So this is when you go so far in spin that you can actually see individual, you can resolve individual twist groups, like leading twist, and then there is 
you add some transverse derivatives, you get two higher in twist, but when you're at lower spin and you go higher in twist, then this is where you get all these complicated trajectories that you think that three-body problem should have. So what would be the simple sector where I would see uh, something uh, a little bit, not, ca not yet chaotic, but something like three planets that start doing some funny trajectories? It would be such things are encoded in the spectrum. Is there a transition region where things are starting to become a little bit less regular? And is that, uh, you say, when you have to put lots of transverse... Uh, I mean, in principle, if you study the same classical version of this, then uh, like slightly different from this, when you kind of also make the mass large, then there are kind of funny trajectories even within this regime, but they are still kind of integral because they're just follow the center contours. And if you want to see like the real uh, chaotic yeah, thing, like that, that then you three have things that are rotating. It should still be large spin, right? I mean, it's still they still move on ADS scales, but they pass by each other and. Like in the net, in Netflix. Ah, so here the, the thing is that if 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 if, if the distances are large compared to ADS scale, so the spin is large, then then they will tend not to come close to each other. Of the same order, say, you know, it's not enough to. No, th that would probably be enough. Then you can you can have that. But this is when they are much further away than the ADS scale. But you agree, there should be a semi-classical regime with chaos, right? Because there exists three planets, it's chaotic. So, so certainly, just not a large spin leading twist. Okay. Apologies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very good. So uh, let's thank uh, Jeremy.